Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's webinar during Women's Month in South Africa. My name is Randall Jonas, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this morning's session with our guest speaker, Ms. Maurice, and also our facilitator, Shireen from Dr. Shireen von Sell. You know, this country and throughout the world celebrates um, Women's Month each year. In South Africa, it is August and overseas, I think in the UK, it is in March. But why do we celebrate Women's Month? Maybe I think it's important that maybe it's a little bit good to step back in history just to see what happened in South Africa and then go overseas and see why it is being celebrated there. And then maybe to cream it off, to look at some of the 12, the quotes from some of the most important women in the world who changed world history. So August in South Africa is Women's Month and we celebrated Women's Month on the 9th of, of August this year. South Africa commem commemorates Women's Month as a tribute to the more than 20,000 women who marched to the union buildings in Pretoria on the 9th of August in 1956 as they protested against the extension of past laws to women. As you know, in South Africa, past laws was an apartheid invention to restrict the movement of non-white people, and particularly black people. And of course, as it was, it was also a debilitating uh, humiliation for women, particularly because they could not move around. Movement throughout the country had their names put on petitions and indicated their anger and frustration of having their freedom of movement restricted by the hated official passes. And that led, gave us the history of Women's Month in South Africa. But overseas also, we find that March of every year is declared National Women's Month. And this is anchored on, in 2021, the theme it has been, we make change work for women. <clears throat> that celebration aims to highlight the empowerment of, empowerment of women as active contributors to and claim holders of development. So as you can see, from a political evolution to now more making meaningful contributions to the evolution and change and development of society. <clears throat> so it's an annually declared month in South Africa and overseas in the UK, and it highlights the contributions of women to events in history and contemporary society. One day, I made a statement to our staff at the business school and I said, women bring a certain measure of softness to the world. And I know that it may have sound very controversial, but I tried to explain that in a very, very hard, cruel, unrelenting world, women brings a perspective that is refreshing. They bring a perspective that gives that softness that sort of makes things real and makes it normal again. It makes it easy to absorb life because women brings that softness to the world. That is what I meant. And I think an interesting thing that I came across this year in, my, in, in, in doing some research on women is that there's actually a particular color that is actually attributed to, to Women's Month. Internationally, purple, is the color for symbolizing women. Historically, the combination of purple, green, and white symbolizes women equality. And this originated from the Women's Social and Political Union in the United Kingdom in 1908. So purple really signifies justice and dignity. At the business school and where I worked previously, we believe that it's not just about Women empowerment it is powering women that is important. In other words, women stand up for themselves and men and people in society must afford women the opportunity to thrive as well. 
it all is all about acknowledging the contributions that they've made over many, many years, and also the contributions that they are still making in the world today. When I Googled the women that have impacted the world, I came across a few names. <clears throat> Sadly, in that uh, 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 web search, I found 12, but all of them are foreigners. They are not South Africans, but I thought maybe I should share some of the wisdom and the pearls of wisdom that came from the pens of these women, because it is universal wisdom that they have shared, and it had impacted a lot of the movement for women's emancipation throughout the history of mankind. And today, we celebrate that, that, that history in meaningful ways. I'm so pleased to say that in our country, we have actually set aside the month of August and the day of the 9th of August to actually celebrate this magnificent contribution that women has made to history. So starting with Queen Elizabeth in the United Kingdom, she ruled, that's Queen Elizabeth I, she ruled from 1533 to 1603. And she said the following, though the sex to which I belong is considered weak, you will nevertheless find me a rock that bends to no wind. And I think you will remember that other famous saying about you strike a rock. Then there was an interesting lady, and I must say, <clears throat> the words of this lady, a poem that she wrote, impacted on me in the 1980s. I was still a teacher and a principal of high school when I went into one of my colleagues' classrooms. Um, she was also <clears throat> an activist at the time. And there was a poster poem, <clears throat> poem with a sketch of a woman. And the title of that that, that poem, I'll tell you now what it was, was so profound to me because it asked a question, but it's not a question. It was actually a statement that it made. And this statement was actually from the word or the mouth of Sojourner Truth. She was an American black activist, one of the most inspirational women in American history uh, who lived from 1797 to 1883. Her words were then, truth is powerful and it prevails. Sojourner Truth is one of the most inspirational black women in America's history. And her words belong to one of the most famous speeches by any woman. An African-American abolitionist and women's rights activist, Truth delivered a now famous speech at the Ohio Women's Rights Convention in Akron 1851 that has come to be known as, and this is the poem that I really felt is not just a question, it's a statement that is profoundly assertive about women's role in society today. And it reads, ain't I a woman? It is such a beautiful poem that I think it's perhaps good to share it with, with people that are in this audience today. And that was the famous speech by Truth Sojourner. Truth was separated from her family at the age of nine and was subsequently sold for auction as a slave along with a flock of sheep for $100. In 1829, she tried to escape for freedom with her infant daughter, Sophia, but the other two children had to, had to be left behind. Another woman that actually also made a profound statement was Edith Cowan in 1861 to 1932. She said, women are very desirous of their being placed on absolutely equal terms with men. We ask for neither more nor less than that. And I can truly say that we've come a long way since these trailblazers of women in our country and overseas in the world, that we've come a long way to celebrate the contribution of women on equal footing to men. If you think about the great um, inventions made by people, uh, uh, women included, one can clearly understand why it is so important to celebrate this momentous occasion each year in our country and in the world, so that we can continue to make that profound statement and not just a question in the words of Ruth Sojourner, and ain't I a woman? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand you over now to Shireen Van Sale, 
who will take us further on this journey. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Jonas, for the opening address. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this webinar, which forms part of the Business Recovery to Growth webinar series. The webinar series, which runs from June to October 2021, is offered by the Business School at the Nelson Mandela University. Um, let me introduce myself again. I am Dr. Shireen van Sale, Head of the Tourism Department at the Nelson Mandela University. The Tourism Department is located in the School of Economics, Development and Tourism in the Faculty of Business and Economic Science. Um, we, you've met um, Dr. Jonas, Dr. Randall Jonas. He is the director of the business school. And Dr. Jonas has taken us through his opening address. And um, we, will, um, we will now move forward. And I'm going to just basically just um, check that everybody's uh, mics are off at this stage, please. If you could just please put your mic off as we go further on our program. So welcome to everybody. Thanks again for joining us this morning. Today's webinar is presented by Mrs. Lazelle Maurice. Uh, Mrs. Lazelle Maurice is the Executive Director of the Border Kai Chamber of Business. Um, in the Border Kai's Chamber of Business's existence for 144 years to date, Mrs. Lazelle Maurice is the first ever female executive of the Border Kai Chamber of Business, and that is quite significant. So we welcome Mrs. Lizelle Maurice, who is our keynote speaker at today's webinar. Mrs. Maurice will address the topic, how can we build local tourism to be a catalyst for economic growth? So let me introduce our esteemed guest who is really no stranger to the business community. As Lizelle Maurice is a child of the Eastern Cape soil. Lizelle was born on the 18th of May, 1970 in the rural town of Lady Frey on the outskirts of Queenstown where she grew up on a farm. Her mother was a strong woman of faith. Her father, a school principal and an, an entrepreneur. This is how Lizelle learned about entrepreneurship. Her father owned a trading store on the border of the former Transkai. This is where Lizelle spent her holidays, where she worked to earn extra cash, serving in the shop over the counter and counting the coins that had to get ready for banking. After matriculating in 1988, Lizelle st uh, studied several tertiary courses through the Coronation Nursing College, UNISA, Damlin, UCT, and Buffalo City College. However, Lizelle firmly believes that no formal education prepares you for what life hands you, and firmly believes that she has a PhD in life. And Lizelle, that is awesome. <laughs> After receiving the Top Manager in South Africa Award in Thailand in May 2012, Lizelle resigned from the cookware company, um, it was AMC Classic. So she resigned from um, AMC Classic at the time to manage their family-owned hospitality venture, Park Place Boutique Hotel, trading as Park Place Boutique Guest House. Um, Park Place Boutique Guest House has an on-site restaurant, a fully licensed bar, and an executive conference center. Since opening her own hospitality complex, Lizelle has received several awards, including being the 2014 provincial winner of the National Tourism Department's Lilizella Awards in the Emerging Tourism Entrepreneur of the Year category, and second runner-up nationally. In 2015, she was the first runner-up of the 2015 Tsoho Sun Entrepreneur of, the, Entrepreneur of the Year Award and has been part of the Entrepreneur Development Program since 2014. Lizelle is a risk taker and an entrepreneur at heart and believes one should open one's, heart, um, one's eyes to the many opportunities that lay before us. Lizelle is passionate about developing people and in particular women. Having served on the chairperson of the Business Women's Association for five years and provincial chairperson for women in tourism. She has also served on several boards, including the boards of Border Cricket, St. Bernard's Hospice, Cooper King Development Trust, the Leadership Development Institute, Abbotsford Christian Center, and Gatekeepers South Africa. Other involvements have been area director of BNI. Lizelle is a certified etiquette, image, and communications coach, having received a certification through Global Success Strategies in Dubai in 2008. 
More recently, she became a certified John Maxwell leadership trainer in September 2020. Informally known as a connector of people and global influencer, Lizelle is passionate about life and people and holds the belief that we are created by God to live abundantly, to be a blessing to others and to make a tangible and visible impact. Lizelle is a mother of two and a grandmother of five. So just a few housekeeping, uh, just a few house rules before we proceed. Um, if you have any questions during Lizelle's um, presentation, please um, just type them in the chat the chat box, you can access your chat box at the bottom of your screen in the control panel. And um, once this, this, the keynote address is over, Lizelle will then answer the questions um, that you will pose. So I do hope that um, you'll sit back and relax. And Lizelle, um, it is over to you. Can you please unmic yourself? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for that introduction. Um, good morning, colleagues, Dr. Randall, Leanne, Terence, uh, Dr. Shireen, and everyone, all of our, uh, the audience here this morning, thank you so much for, for that wonderful welcome. And thank you for having me speak to you this morning. I'm going to start my presentation by sharing um, a video just to excite us a bit about the audio, uh, about the domestic tourism, because that is what my talk is all about today, is um, using um, tourism, domestic tourism, uh, as a catalyst to build the economy. Thank you so much. I hope that excited you a bit um, for what domestic, uh, what we have as a country. We have a beautiful country. We have a beautiful place. So I'm just going to start my presentation. Can you see my screen? Um, <clears throat> thank you so much. So first of all, uh, the question is, how can we build local tourism as a catalyst for economic growth? Now we saw during the, the tourism sector was the most affected with um, COVID-19 especially, you know, so we haven't had international tourists coming in um, and we've really solely had to rely on domestic tourism and to promote it. So why are we asking this question this morning? First of all, we can see that Stats SA says South Africa co uh, contributes, uh, the contribution of the tourism sector to GDP was 130 billion rand in 2018 and constituted 3% direct contribution to GDP. And in 2018, again, the tourism sector contributed about 4.5% of total employment in South Africa. Now, according to the Tourism 2020 report released by Stats South Africa, foreign arrivals dropped by 71% from just over 15.8 million in 2019 to less than 5 million in 2020. So, you know, it, you can see why we're having this conversation of trying to promote domestic tourism as a catalyst to revive the local economy, because you can see the drop in foreign arrivals uh, from 1919, 2019 to 2020. And the distribution of tourists by region of residence shows that 74.8% of the tourists who arrived in South Africa in 2020 were actually residents of the SADC region. And um, overseas, uh, tourists from overseas country only made up about 23.6% of tourists. So it actually makes sense that we have a conversation about leveraging on what we have, the assets that we have as a country to promote domestic tourism. We need to become tourists and travelers in our own province, in our own country. So we can see here, I'm going to take it from 2013 right up to 2020. You can see there, how much did visitors spend in 2013? You can see 57% 
of the 218.9 billion rand was spent by domestic visitors, you know, not international visitors. You know, those that then uh, what did visitors spend on? You can see there road transport, non-specific products, accommodation, air transport, tourism connecting products and other. In 2015, we can see that the number of people employed in the tourism industry was 711,746. Where are the tourism jobs concentrated? You can see there mostly road transport, um, food and beverage, accommodation, retail of products and other. And one in every 22 people employed in individuals in the country are form part of the tourism industry. You can see that the tourism sector employed more than the mining sector during that particular year. Fast forward in 2017, tourism created 31,752 net new jobs in 2017. And it and more than the manufacturing and even more than in the mining sector. So you can see that tourism really uh, uh, contributes a lot to the GDP of our country and to our economy. Four and a half percent of our total work workforce was part of the tourism industry. So we can see, uh, so, so where did all this come from? What is the annual spend? If you can see over the last four years, from 70, 2017 right up to 2020, the annual total spend was um, the highest in 2019. Obviously, that was pre-COVID. And you can see year on year, it actually increased a lot. You know, we cannot talk about current, or how we utilize the, the domestic tourism as a catalyst currently, unless we look at the historical data that exists. And these reports are taken from the South African tourism website. And you can see that we spent over 40 billion rand, you know, in 2019 on tourism. The holiday trips by quarter, I found this very interesting because you can see at the bottom there, the, the only tourism spend in quarter one of 2020 uh, um, was the only one for the 2020 here. You can see the difference there. Um, quarter one, 2.3 million rand was spent um, in tourism as a whole. So we can see the different quarters. There you can see the total spend by quarter again, and it's uh, over 37 billion rand. Uh, quarter one of 2020, once again, uh, a lot higher. I think when, when, when the COVID hit and when reports were there, the lockdown, people really scrambled to get back to their places. And I think that is why travel uh, uh, in quarter one of 2020 was so high. You know, people, uh, the, um, the lockdown was looming and people needed to get back to their places of abode. There we see the total bed nights over the, the quarter, over the years. You'll see there 2017, 2018, 2019, color coded. And you can see the quarter one versus quarter three. There in 2019, you can see quarter three in 2019 was the highest with um, 30 million uh, P, um, travel bed nights being sold. Also in quarter four of uh, 2019, which was the last December where we really enjoyed ourselves before COVID. The length of stay averages between three to five. Um, uh, bed nights, if you can put it that way, number of nights that people stay in a particular place. And we have our annual provincial, annual provincial bed nights. We can see a lot of people still sleep with family and friends. And then we have the hotels, which is second there, 7.4 million bed nights in uh, 2019. A lot of people enjoy self-catering, guest houses, um, other Airbnbs, backpackers, ho hostels, bed and breakfast, game lodges, camping, caravanning, you know, uh, travel by train and by ship. Um, that's the blue train and that's your MSC, your hospital visits. And there's couch surfing, which is the new technological uh, tourism where you exchange uh, accommodation between one another. 
Then you have your average length of stay by province. You can see Western Cape is still the highest visited province, and I think particularly Cape Town. Um, and then the Free State, the Eastern Cape is third. So if everybody here is from Eastern Cape, uh, as part of our audience this morning, you can see we are third when it comes to the average length of stay by province. Leisure tourism still makes up the majority of why people travel. They travel to go on holiday. They travel for beach, to go to beaches, you know, just to enjoy uh, the place. Adventure tourism is the next. I know the Eastern Cape is very big. In fact, Eastern Cape Parks and Tourism Agency brands this Eastern Cape province as the adventure province. Very much in contention, I think, with the office of the Premier that wants to, to, to actually brand our province as the province of legends, because so many of our legends have come from here, our past presidents, etc. But adventure is still very, very much why people visit the Eastern Cape province. You can see them. Sports tourism is a big draw card at the moment. And with that, I'm actually going to stop my presentation and just show you a short video of actually Ironman in uh, Port Elizabeth that really brings a lot of revenue um, for, um, in, for, for, for the province as a whole. But I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually play it at the end, right at the end, just before we take our Q&A. So Nelson Mandela once said, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else can. Sport can awaken hope where there was previously only despair. I don't know who if you remember in the 1995 with the Rugby World Cup, we had just come from the very first democratic elections. We had our first black president as a country. And in 1995, the South African World uh, Cup for rugby uh, was held. And that unified, we needed that uh, a sporting event at that particular moment because it really unified us as a country. Some other statistics show, for example, in 2010, the Comrades Marathon contributed to, to Durban and, and Peter Maritzburg 130 million rand to those cities. And statistics show that over a five year period, the Comrades, the Doozy Canoe Marathon and Midma Mile actually contributed to the, to the economy of KZN more than what to the 2010 Soccer World Cup contributed as a single event. So you can see sports tourism has really, uh, um, is a really, really big part of promoting domestic tourism as well. You can see there the Comrades Marathon and, and for those cities, Peter Maritzburg and Durban, as I said, in 2010, it really contributed 130 million Rand in those particular cities. Cultural tourism is another big one that is broke up in the Western Cape. Um, really, we need to leverage on our assets. When it comes to domestic tourism, we really need to leverage on what we have in our towns, in our cities, and in our provinces. This is the best, apparently, I haven't uh, visited this kind of festival yet, but apparently this is a Wilston winter festival that happens in the Northern Cape, and it's one of the best cultural festivals. It happens just before just at the end of winter, just before spring. So I'm sure when you go onto the Wilston Winter Festival Facebook page, you'll be able to see. Apparently, they say it is the best cultural experience in the country that you can have. Heritage and historical tourism is another one. That is Robben Island. A lot of uh, um, visitors visit. Um, the, uh, especially domestic uh, travelers, they visit the historical sites, the heritage sites. Township tourism has become more popular, especially among our youth. They really, you know, young people are very adventurous. They, they, I think their fear compass is a lot lower than, than older people. So they go into the townships and can see that was in Kayalicha Township in Cape Town. Township tourism has really become popular. Religious tourism, and I and I have to say, South Africa hasn't really tapped into this kind of tourism as yet. When you go overseas, even non-Christians visit uh, old churches. You know, um, that is what the European market really leverage off. 
they their churches that they have there. And I think South Africa needs to tap into that more uh, as part of our um, domestic tourism. Um, I don't know if you know this church is in Kharafrenet. I absolutely love this church. It is such a, a spectacular building. So religious tourism. And when, I, when you think about it in um, the Zionist church, I'm sure you, you know about the Zionist church that thousands of them converge during the Easter weekend on Moria, you know, and um, even uh, religious uh, conferences, uh, I know the Ethiopian Episcopal Church also spends a lot. They spend a lot on conferencing. They spend a lot on um, um, on Easter, uh, on these religious uh, dates and events. Business travel is, a, is another um, part of your tourism that we need to leverage on because businesses travel a lot. Corporate travelers, they go and do meetings um, in, in various provinces, in various places. So that forms a big part of our domestic tourism. And you know, with domestic tourism, when, when people come for business, 100% of the time, they come back to a place to, as a leisure traveler. So really this is a, um, a component or part of the domestic tourism that we really need to leverage on more. Then we have the mice uh, tourism or the mice industry, uh, meetings, incentives, conferences and events, and it has become popular. And I think th this kind of tourism has really uh, resulted in us uh, creating the ICCs in our various uh, metropolitan cities, the convention center, you know, so it is because this kind of tourism has become very popular and which then resulted in the creation of those convention centers. Business uh, tourism or our mice industry as usually our product launches, our company milestones, seminars and conferences, board meetings, shareholder meetings, executive retreats and incentive, incentive programs. Incentive programs are really those where your company awards you. Um, I know the direct selling market, like your um, uh, press list, your Tupperwares, your AMC cookies, they use a lot of incentive programs. Um, old mutuals, the insurance industry, where they award their top salespeople by giving them, uh, booking them incentive travel. Then we have our ecotourism, which are nature reserves, national parks. In fact, what is interesting to note is that 10% of the world's plant species is found in South Africa. And of the 10%, 65% of them are found only in South Africa. And then another interesting fact is that in South Africa, we have 100 species of mammals, 900 species of birds and 120 species of amphibians. So really ecotourism is uh, very popular, especially with people who love nature. What do we need to do as an industry, as tourism products, as, as a country? We need to leverage in our cities. We need to look at what do we have as a country? And I'm sure the audience will agree with me when we say that South Africa is a beautiful country. And before we go and explore other countries, we should actually become tourists in our own country, leverage on what we have. If the, the Eastern Cape, we have, we had our Nelson Mandela, our previous president, our, uh, and I mentioned that the uh, office of the premier wants to brand, uh, wanted to brand our country, our, our province, or still brands our province as the province of legends. Um, Previous presidents have come from here, Tabu Mbeki from Aduchua. We have Oliver Tambo, you know, and our um, uh, national airport, our international airport in Johannesburg is named after him. So we're leveraging, you know, doing those kinds of things that we leverage on the assets that we have. One of the things that we need to leverage on is our people. Our people are our assets as a, a, a country. You know, so when we have in, uh, tourism and promote domestic tourism, make sure if you are a tourism establishment, um, especially within the accommodation sector, 
make sure that you hire the right people. You know, you have to hire people's people in order to, to receive people because you want to provide that excellent customer service. And I have to say, sometimes with some people, hospitality does not come natural. So you have to ensure that you, you hire the right people to attract domestic tourism into your city, into your, into your particular province and into your particular region as well. Um, what another statistic shows that people come to a place that is clean. So cleanliness, tourists look for cleanliness of a city. They look for safe and secure um, um, cities. So I, I definitely think that the, the domestic tourism of KZN has taken a, a knock with these recent looting and unrest that has happened in the province, but I'm sure they will definitely arise again from the ashes. And uh, it is important for tourism establishment to belong to industry bodies, you know, belong to tourism. Um, we have the Tourism Business Council. There's various that you can be part of. Um, EC Tour, I know in uh, Port Elizabeth there, you know, um, make sure you are technologically advanced. You stay up to date with technology. I mean, these days, people do not come to an establishment that does not have Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi has become like oxy oxygen to any person, to any traveler. It has become such an uh, important component that, uh, of a traveler, internet access. It is all about the experience. So ensure, make sure that the client, that your client that you receive at your tourism establishment is, um, is you give that particular traveler and tourist an experience that they can remember. Thank you so much. Uh, is there any other questions that I can take? Um, Lizelle, there is one question in the chat. Okay. I just want to read it. Um, just one second. Lizelle, I, um, can, can you um, close the presentation at the stage? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, so the, the question there, um, Swanapool um, asked the question, please touch on historical tourism. I know you referred to that. Um, is London or slummies as it is called, is the gateway to Transkei and in a disgustingly dirty and neglected state. And you also mentioned the importance of cleanliness because yeah. obviously tourists do not want to come to dirty places. So something needs to be done and we have the most beautiful historic buildings that could be jewels in the East London crown. So if you could maybe comment on this um, question, and I also want to invite the participants to put further questions in the chat group. And um, uh, I, as you put your questions in, I will direct the questions to Lizelle. Thank you, Lizelle, if you could maybe address this question. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for that. Uh, cleanliness is definitely very important. And that is why uh, we as a chamber, especially particularly in East London, uh, where we are based as the Bordakai Chamber of Business, we have created a partnership with our municipality and we've established what we call a waste management committee uh, here at the chamber. So we've been meeting over the last few weeks, uh, every second, every second week we come together and the city is very open to that because they realize that, uh, um, you know, they lack in capacity to actually keep the city clean. So they've created a partnership with us as um, the private sector. So what we what we're doing is we are going to be inputting into their integrated waste management master plan as well. We're busy doing that as well, and we will be presenting to the council as well because we need a bigger budget to keep the city clean. And I know that is that is one of the things which we commented on in the integrated development plan of the city, that there wasn't enough budget allocated to keep the city clean. And it is of paramount importance. I agree with you to, to, to ensure that our city is clean, to attract more travelers to our city. But we are in the process of doing that, um, seeing what we can, or we are becoming part of the solution if I can say that, uh, by creating this waste management committee here at the chamber. Another thing that we've also been encouraging our citizens in the, in the 
in the city to do is because when you talk about a dirty city, who forms part of a city? The citizens of the city. So if you say the city is dirty, you know, you've, you've played a part to that. So we've told people, you know what? Even if you just clean in front of your own pavement, you know, just in front of your own pavement, everybody took that responsibility and start owning the cities that they live in. We would have cleaner cities, that's for sure. And that speaks very much to East London. I hope I'm able to, uh, was able to answer that question. Yes, th thank you for that, uh, Lizelle. And um, we've got another comment in the chat box from Glenda Perumol, um, basically saying, thank you, Lizelle, brilliant presentation. We are, now, we are no longer called Port Elizabeth, so our new name, Kibber. <laughs> uh, Lizelle, what are your thoughts around that? And how is it going to maybe influence our brand? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Kobecha, uh, my, my absolute apologies to the um, patriots of Port Elizabeth, well, Kobecha, if I could put it that way. Thank you so much uh, for that comment. Uh, you know, when it comes to name changes, uh, apparently Port Elizabeth was called Kobecha way before Queen Elizabeth landed on our soil. So I think, um, you know, going back and renaming the city was just going, trying to reclaim our previous heritage and our history, uh, our past, if I could say that, you know. So uh, I know it does take a bit of getting used to that you've, you were raised in a city previously called Port Elizabeth. Now you have having to get used to the name Port Tabecha uh, again, but it is just part of going back to the original roots of our province and of our cities. Okay, thank you, Lizelle. We have a comment from Kaya Matiso, um, still on the previous question, and Kaya has been commenting on um, keeping our cities clean. It's more exciting than ever before. It's a necessary campaign let us make the campaign popular. And he fully agrees. And um, Maura has commented and said, and they are still on the previous one around East London. And there is only about half the garbage trucks working in East London. And only one garage transfer station out in Berlin. Thank you for your answer. We are daily out cleaning beaches. So um, we, can, we can see a lot of um, the focus here is still on the cleanliness and, um, you know, the, the need to obviously make sure that we offer, um, you know, cleanliness as part of our tourism offering. The next question from Pumeza, Kate, what do you think, what needs to be done as it is COVID and, and COVID is here to stay? Yes, I believe in township tourism. However, the safety and security issue, if having an idea, but capital is an issue. So I think if, if we look at this question, I think um, you, you, you spoke a little bit around township tourism, Lizelle, but there is this concern around safety and security. Um, and and, and what, what can one do? Because um, as she says, COVID is easier to stay um, going forward. Um, how, how, how can we address this a little bit more? You know, when it comes to, to township tourism, as I said, you know, it's it's particularly popular with the younger generation, you know, that has an appetite that it's almost like they have a fearlessness to want to experience. I think the same reason, the same reason why somebody would go bungee jumping, uh, you know, for that adrenaline rush is the same reason uh, uh, why, why some people would probably go into uh, the 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 township as well where they where they where they where they want to experience but they also realize that uh, maybe security and safety could be an issue in the township you know historically I'm talking about historical uh, um, uh, as history has shown you know so um, the same for that same adrenaline rush or for the adventure they go in there in fact township tourism falls under when I was looking up adventure tourism, it said part of that was under township tourism. It's a part of the adventure to experience, to come out of your comfort zone. And a lot of us are so comfortable to go to what we are familiar with and what we what we know, you know, the comforts. And yet 
there's a, there's, there's a part of our travelers that want to experience the discomfort. They want to go to what they are not used to. And that is why township tourism has become so popular. In terms of the safety and security aspect, uh, I know that community policing has become more popular. Uh, I mean, more prevalent now where the SAPS has engaged in community policing, community forums, there's neighborhood watches that have come up. And in fact, we had a webinar on the 30th of July on the last day where we called all our CEOs in our city because we wanted to know, you know, and we called our district commissioner as well as our taxi bosses because they were instrumental in foiling our um, the recent uh, lootings, um, you know, that were prevalent in KZN, they foiled it. They were instrumental in foiling it here in the Eastern Cape. So we brought them to a webinar and we asked the question, how safe are our cities? You know, so those dialogues we need to have with our SAPS, with our law enforcement, and we need to call them out, you know, and we need as citizens to become part of the, the solution as well. You know, when they are not doing a good job, when we don't feel safe, we address them, we call them out and we say, come, let us have a conversation. Now more than ever before, we need to engage one another, we need to collaborate, um, et cetera. Yes, um, and I think you've answered Sasha, um, Sasha's question. Who, um, she asked, has there been engagement with visible policing? Because obviously the police is an important stakeholder to yes. address crime and, and that needs to be done, okay? And then we've got a question from um, Buntu Bam who says, let's encourage rural tourism and work with communities in the areas in, uh, where people feel part of the business value chain. And of course, um, um, you, you can maybe comment on that one. I'm going to also just take a few and maybe you can just give us a holistic um, uh, um, answer. Um, he also goes on to say provincial government and private sector should be working together. And of course, for tourism, we need our stakeholders to work together. So that is an important point. And we have another question from Dr. Jonas who's um, saying localization has been punted globally as a panacea for economic recovery in the COVID period. The stats about domestic tourism is encouraging and in a low touch economy, it appears the way to go. However, what can tourism establishments do in terms of accessibility and affordability for local people? So if you can comment on those before I go to the next one. Thanks, Lizelle. Yes, uh, thank you for that. You know that um, I always tell establishments that people do not come to your establishment to sleep. When they make the decision to travel to a, a, a particular city or a particular town, the accommodation is the last thing they think about. They come there for a purpose, whether it be, uh, for example, if you go to Titsikama, whether it be those canopy tours that they were going to, uh, whether it be to visit the beaches in East London or to visit um, a theme park in Cape Town, the buying decision of the establishment is the last thing that they think of. They first want, they go to the adventure, they go, they go for a business meeting, they go for a conference, they go for incentive travel, they go for a sporting event. So what we need to do as uh, the tourism sector is to look at our pricing, you know, um, as establishments, first of all, we mustn't, we, we must actually do market research and uh, benchmark ourselves against other uh, establishments. What are we charging? Are we charging uh, um, fair prices? Even our attractions, our game drives, etc. We need to for you know in when you travel overseas. I'm making an example. They have a different rate for international tourists, and they have a different rate for do, for the locals in the particular place. And I think South Africa needs to do that as well. I find that South Africa does not really do that, you know, because what they charge for an international, I don't know if they've changed now. I think more and more there is a change towards reducing prices, but I find that inter, um, you know, especially those uh, um, activities or attractions that attract, inter that used to attract international travelers need to reduce their prices when it comes to attracting the locals to spend at their establishments. I don't know if I've answered all that question. There were there were many questions in one question. So I just want us to go back, uh, Shireen. Uh, 
And with that, I think she's dropped off. I'll just look at the chat to see if I see any other questions. As um, Shireen gets back. Bazel, is Randall yes. here? I've posted a question from Masibulele Tabata as well, but he put the question in the, um, in the uh, Q&A. So I put it there, but I feel there's a question from Shamalani. Uh, good day, Lazelle. I'm currently Hello. doing this. Can you hear me? Uh, um, yes. Okay. I'm just doing this question for you while Shereen is trying to get back. One of the famous streets in Soweto is Vilakazi Street that gained its stripes during the Soweto uprising. Vilakazi Street depends highly on international tourists. And with the COVID-19 hitting, hitting the country, the street, has, the, has, the street has taken a knock. What measures do business owners need to do to revive their businesses through domestic tourism and technology? I think it's probably related to the previous question. And then the second one is one from Mr. Tabata or Mr. Tabata. Given the nature and complexity of the tourism industry, what are some of the opportunities available for employment in the industry? So there's two questions for you to maybe to deal with. And then from there, we'll go to Glenton de Cox issue and then we'll take it further. Thank you so much, Rizal. You know, uh, some of the opportunities, thanks Dr. Randall for that. Some of the opportunities within the tourism sector, for example, um, besides, um, you know, the, the tourism sector has a wide range of um, um, job opportunities some more technical than others. For example, if you want to work at a game park, you have to be a qualified game ranger in order to, to be the tour guide in a game park. Whereas um, you have to become a, a South African tour specialist in order to be a tour guide. Sorry, am I back? I was muted there. I saw that I was muted. Can everybody yes, hear me back. now? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, super. You know, so there's a the, there's when we talk about restaurants, caterers, you know, a chefs, qualified chefs. Um, if you are a chef and you do not have employment at the moment, nothing stops you from starting to operate at home. They from home. There's many opportunities. People are too scared. Some people are too scared now with COVID. So the opportunity that that has presented for a chef, for example, is that they can uh, uh, um, outsource their their services or they can hire out their services to the family in the the privacy of their own home where they are not. Uh, uh, together with the people in a restaurant, for example, you know, so there's different opportunities that this presents that has been presented through this uh, COVID pandemic as well. Are there any other questions that I answer your yes. question right? Yes, mm -hmm. I think, uh, uh, Lazelle, if you could just maybe also just comment on the Villas Gazi Street one, the measures that business owners need to do to revive their business through domestic tourism and the role of technology. I think you did touch on technology as well. It's an important uh, factor, you know, in, yes. in attracting tourists. Thank you so much. Yes, very much so. Digital marketing is very, very important, especially in this day and age. Um, you One cannot afford to be in business and you are not tech savvy. You have to become tech savvy in business. There's various platforms you can market yourself out on. There's various online travel agents you can market yourself uh, on um, this at the moment, if you register yourself on SouthAfrica.net website, there's packages that you can put out, combined packages, business people can come together. If you're a restaurant owner, you're an attraction, you have a house in Vilakazi Street, uh, you have an accommodation establishment, come together, collaborate and say, let us uh, uh, create a tour. Let us create a package, uh, of, uh, maybe over a weekend, um, where we can attract tourism or, or, or travelers to our region. For example, I think collaborating with one another as business people is critical and is key at this stage, especially if you have uh, attractions, in, attractions in close proximity um, of one another. Thank you so much, uh, Lazelle. I am also very, very pleased to welcome Glinton de Kock from Salki. Uh, Glinton has made some comments and I want you to maybe comment on them. 
Thanks for the insights, Lizelle and colleagues. He says, as we focus on recovery, we need to be mindful that building consumer confidence will be key. While the industry has extensive safety protocols and product and consumer confidence needs a look, a look, a look at work as they still fear to move around our country, particularly in the business travel sector. I think that is a very critical consideration. And then he also says that we need to also look at how do we run a parallel vaccination rollout against the how tourism industries opened up by the government, you know. I think it's a very interesting point to discuss, you know, because I don't think government actually is, is, is using the, 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 the vaccination rollout and the, the progress being made to open up a country like other international countries are doing. And I think Clinton is suggesting that that should be considered. If you can comment then on the whole story of safety and, and consumer confidence, and then also perhaps the comment that he made around the parallel opening up of the country as vaccination rollout is increasing. Thank you. Yes, yeah. thank you for that question. You know, when it comes to consumer confidence, it is important for us as product owners, as tourism establishments, as tourism attractions to make sure that there's, there's visible, that we have our COVID protocols visibly displayed, that it is part of our marketing strategy as well. Uh, uh, people want to know when they come to your establishments that you have the necessary in place, you know, to prevent the spread of uh, the COVID-19. So it is critical that that needs to be part of our messaging when we put our, um, our marketing material on our various uh, marketing platforms, social media platforms. Um, it needs to be visible. Um, there needs to be, um, hmm. uh, when it comes to the, the, the vaccine rollout, um, <sighs> that is another, you know, obviously we don't have control as the tourism sector of how, how quickly the country, the, the vaccination rollout or the program is being managed by the Department of Health. But uh, certainly we can influence, you know, by engaging with the various uh, health um, uh, officials, you know, and seeing how can we assist in the effective rollout of the vaccine. I know that the president wasn't too happy uh, with the recent, it's almost as if there's been a decline in the number of people going out, going for vaccination. So we just have to be mindful and ensure that the necessary protocols are in place when people visit our establishments. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, Lazelle. I am so pleased to see that Dr. Serene Fonsel is back. Dr. Fonsel, we have been trying to facilitate some of the questions um, as you, uh, I think you had some connectivity losses there. Uh, so I'm going to just hand over back to you. I think uh, just to maybe just uh, to bring you into the loop, we've dealt with most of the uh, chats and questions that are in the chat box. Uh, just the last comment from Mr. Swanapool, Morag Swanapool, uh, thanking you so much, Maurice, uh, um, uh, Lazelle Maurice. There should be more people like you on the ball and in action. We would like to contact you sometime. And then, of course, from Sasha Boucher in 2019 in Nelson Mandela Bay, I, alongside some foreign visitors, went to the museum and the Krakakama Garden, Krakakama Game Reserve. The museum, for instance, is not well maintained or dated. This is an important site. There is job opportunities around this site. In your opinion, how should this be addressed? I'm going to give you maybe just the 30 seconds to quick have a quick fire on that question, and then we're going to hand back to Shireen wrap up and summarize and close off the session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Mr. Swanapo. Uh, uh, um, Nelson Mandela University do have my contact details. And um, in terms of our amenities and our, our historical sites, they definitely need to be managed uh, better. And that is why it's critical to, to as, as chambers and as, as, as tourism establishments to engage and become actively involved, to engage our local municipalities there because they do have directorates that are supposed to be looking after and taking care of these attractions like your museums, uh, you know, so I know there are some, some things like Friends, I don't know in Tobeja is it so, but in East London, that you have the Friends of the Museum, you have the Friends of the Art Gallery, where those people actually try and influence um, the decision or they influence or they, they, they 
try and influence in the upkeep or they try and get engaged or, or be involved in the upkeep of those amenities because it's definitely a reality that um, some of our museums are outdated. Um, you know, amenities need to be more accessible. Uh, one of the contentious issues that we have here, for example, locally, is that our museums are closed on a weekend. You know, that is when people are not working, you know, so, uh, or, or they close too early. That's another thing. Our amenities close too early, especially those that are managed by our government institutions. They close too early or they're not managed well. And that is why us as ordinary citizens, as product owners, need to be more vocal, need to engage them and say, because the reality, as I said earlier in my talk, sometimes it's a capacity issue. Also, it's a priority issue, prioritizing you know, making sure that those amenities are in place. Now that we've established that domestic tourism is critical in boosting the economy, I'm sure we can go back to them and say, look, this is what uh, uh, we find, that we need to use domestic tourism as a catalyst in order to, to, to increase uh, and boost our economy, economy and to increase and to boost our job uh, creation. Uh, so we need to go back to them and actively engage and collaborate them and guide them as well, you know, and it's not all about an eight to five, you cannot open up an amenity for eight to five because or they're not over the weekend when people are not working, you know, where they can take their children on a weekend, it cannot be closed on a weekend so definitely that is a, a topic or an area that we really need to uh, give more input into. Dr. Randall? Thank you so much. Yeah, I said I was going to hand over back to Dr. Van Sale, um, but I just wanted to actually, uh, uh, Mr. Odo Mutati also raised an interesting question. He said, it is interesting for me that product development continues to be understated, meaning that, you know, the, the whole story of creative and innovation product development seems to be understated in, in how we actually catalyze uh, economic recovery through tourism. Your take on that? What is that? Innovation. Yes, yeah. He says uh, product development continues to be understated. No, absolutely. You know, I think what COVID-19 has taught um, us as a people is that we cannot uh, do business as usual. We have to become more creative. We have to create more income streams. Even in our existing businesses, you know, when you look uh, uh, how we can develop what we have, how we can develop our offering, where we look around. And that's why I said as part of my, 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 my talk and my presentation, let us see what we can leverage on what we have and develop those within our various uh, uh, cities and towns as well. If, um, if we have great artists, great, uh, 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 we can create more art exhibitions that is art tourism was one of the things that I forgot to mention and jazz festivals uh, um, with the Grahamstown Festival which attracts so much so many tourists to the Grahamstown as well so really those are the things that we need to look at we need to go look back sit in the at the drawing board what do we have in our city what do we have in our town currently that we can leverage of uh, how can we expand how can we innovate you know and I think COVID-19 has really taught us to be innovators. We cannot do business as usual anymore. We need to learn to innovate. We need to expand our product offerings. We need to see what we can bring in, what we can learn from other countries who have done it well, for example. Thank you very, very much, uh, Lozelle. I think you know, that last point, it cannot be business as usual. We're living in extraordinary times and innovation. Absolutely product development, creativity is key to how we actually beat, you know, this, this um, um, you know, this downturn in the economy. And we've done a lot of these things as a business school to bring the kind of expertise to these webinars since last year, because we knew that it is an important discussion that people need to have all the time. Based on the questions that we had today, the audience participation, the questions, the comments, and the number of people attending today, combined with your presentation, I'm comfortable that today's webinar was actually quite a revealing and an important one to actually contribute to that discussion around how do we leverage tourism as a catalyst for economic growth. Government has recognized tourism as an important leverage for, for developing the country. And I think 
if we actually move it down to where people are in terms of township tourism and other opportunities that are not explored enough, one should actually see the kind of turnaround that we want to see. For the audience, thank you so much for your questions, for your participation. We really appreciate it. And then, of course, to you, Lizelle, I thought you had a wonderful presentation. Thank you for opening up great insights into how we can do this. And it's nice working with you. I hope to see you sometime soon down in East London when we get up there again. And may God bless you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Terence and Leanne and Dr. Van Sale in her absence. He's not here today but, uh, now because of uh, a break in transmission. We want to thank you all for making this possible. Thank you so much. And once again, you know, please look out for our next webinar in the Business Rebound series. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day further. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Goodbye.